All right, so let's get started at 7.30. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce David Madoff uh, to Interventional Radiology for NRAMS this morning. David uh, is Professor of Radiology at Cornell and Vice Chair for Academic Affairs there as well. He went to college at uh, Emory. He then went to medical school in Pittsburgh, did a residency at Stony Brook before doing his fellowship in, uh, in, uh, in Texas at uh, MD Anderson. Was an attending there before being recruited back to Cornell in 2011. David seems pretty smart, but actually that may not be the case because he took on his 13 year old to see who could get the most followers on social media. Academic professor, teenager, he got absolutely trashed. So uh, David, welcome, glad to have you here, thanks. Well, thank you so much for the uh, kind invitation. Uh, very honored to be here. And by the way, um, I do have like five times the number of social media followers than my daughter. So anyway, so what I wanted to talk about today was something that uh, I've been interested in for a very, very long time. It's a topic of liver regeneration. And in particular, uh, mostly you get a focus on portal vein embolization, but there's actually a lot more to it. Um, this is uh, the reason why I wanted to bring this up and show a case from my very first month at MD Anderson was to show how, uh, from a trainee perspective, you could see how you can present an M&M &M case early on in your career, read about the procedure, and then develop an entire career based on something you've never actually heard of. So this is kind of a way of showing how, um, how you can actually, if you're interested in academics, foster a, a career in a particular uh, area that you like. And this case just shows a patient with phalangiocarcinoma who after portal vein embolization developed massive thrombus within the, um, within the main portal vein and left portal vein that was um, thrombolized and ultimately um, did well at surgery. But the point here is that this was something that I had to present as an M&M &M case. Liver regeneration to me is so fascinating because basically you can take these two patients right here, one on the top is one that has bilobar colorectal metastases and has absolutely no chance of really any kind of curative resection and ultimately get that patient to resection by use of liver regeneration techniques. And the same is true of this patient on the bottom who has uh, HCC, a very large one, and you can see again by using uh, liver regeneration techniques how we can then get this patient to live uh, many years uh, later. And I'm actually going to get into these cases in a little while. So uh, the goal for liver regeneration in general and in terms of IR for liver is to uh, improve the safety of or obviate the need to have major liver resection. And another item I want to discuss uh, towards the end of the talk will be um, cellular therapy for treating underlying liver disease. Okay, that's something that I think is uh, very, very novel and something that we will be working on uh, in the future. So just to go back, um, there's been uh, extensive uh, work in hepatic, in hepatic resection to the point where uh, post-operative morbidity and mortality is of major concern. However, uh, the mortality rate is still quite low. Okay? However, um, complications such as flu retention, um, impaired synthetic function, and the hypobilirubinibia still um, uh, contribute to patients' post-operative course. And as you can see here from the data, that uh, even as recently as last decade, you can see that the morbidity and mortality still remain pretty considerable, as high as 8%. And that's in the setting of normal underlying liver. Well, in the setting of um, chronic liver disease, uh, patients that undergo right hepatectomy, um, you can see that patients that have cirrhosis have a nearly 60% chance of mortality after a major hepatic resection. So as you can see, it's very important to try to get these patients uh, help. So we know that when you look at which patients do well after surgery, it's really the size of the future liver remnant, or what we call the FLR. And the, uh, as you can see, the number of overall perioperative complications is a result of the size of the liver remnant. So you can see that there's a direct correlation between the size of the liver remnant and the overall number of complications. That's not to say the, uh, the severity of the complication, just the overall uh, number. And why does that happen? Well, basically, there's an entity called small for size liver syndrome, where you have um, the same amount of portal blood flow going through a much smaller volume of, of liver 
and ultimately, uh, especially in the setting of living donor transplant, liver transplantation, there's a lot of turbulence within the portal system. Uh, the, the blood doesn't get to the cells the way it should, and ultimately these grafts and or these uh, small livers actually fail. So nobody really knows what the absolute limit is for resection. Previous studies have suggested that in order to reduce the morbidity of hepatic resection, at least 20% of the liver must remain in patients with normal underlying liver. That is, for example, patients that have um, colorectal metastases that have never been uh, exposed to chemotherapy. You have 30% in those that have injured liver, it's, for example, those that have steatohepatitis or high-dose chemotherapy, and 40% in those that have cirrhosis but have uh, a normal underlying liver function. It's actually less uh, even for those that have some kind of uh, liver dysfunction. So to help with these issues, uh, one technique that has been uh, proposed has been uh, what's called portal vein embolization. I kind of mentioned that briefly, but what uh, portal vein embolization or PVE does is it redirects portal blood flow to the intended future liver remnant. And by doing so, we can initiate hypertrophy of the non-embolized segment with the goal of ultimately trying to reduce the overall number of perioperative complications and increase the number of potential surgical candidates who have what we call marginal uh, anticipated future liver remnant volumes. That means that we believe that these patients may have volumes that are kind of small. The goal here also is to get these patients to surgery such that they get um, similar survival rates to those patients that um, had surgery but didn't need portal vein embolization. So it's not necessarily the goal to get them to have better survival, but it's to have at least the same survival that they would have had otherwise. And until recently, uh, portal vein embolization has actually been the standard of care at nearly all um, hepatobiliary centers worldwide. And we'll get into competing strategies in a little while. Um, in terms of uh, historical perspectives, we're mostly all aware of the story of uh, Prometheus, who uh, was a titan uh, in, in, in Greek mythology and ultimately gave fire to humans. And uh, Zeus, who was the king of uh, the Greek uh, gods, was very upset by this and basically bound him to a rock and then had an eagle peck out his liver every day and it grew back. So that's the overall story of liver regeneration. However, it wasn't until 1920 where it was actually um, shown experimentally. And there was a study where they uh, ligated the portal vein in rabbits and the part that they embolized, which is called the, or, or ligated, which is called the ipsilateral liver uh, atrophied and the part that uh, was not um, ligated hypertrophy. Okay, <clears throat> and that was in 1920. And then 30-something years later, you can see that they also experimentally confirmed that either bile duct or portal vein occlusion results in similar findings of atrophy hypertrophy complex. Um, and then there was a study in 1986 where they actually did portal vein embolization in order to uh, try to reduce portal vein tumor thrombus extension because we all know that it's really the portal vein tumor thrombus that leads to the prognosis of patients that um, have liver cancer and tumor thrombus. And it wasn't until 1990 where the seminal paper in portal vein embolization, that is a patient in, in 13 patients with Klatskin uh, cholangiocarcinoma, um, where they perform portal vein embolization with the sole purpose of regenerating uh, the liver. Now, in terms of uh, liver generation itself, uh, the mechanisms are still quite poorly understood. It's, it's been unclear whether it was sort of an increase in the size of the cells leading to hypertrophy or in cell number. We'll get into that in a second. We also know that the strongest mitogenic effect is done by hepatocyte growth factor. Now, there's numerous factors that are involved, and one of them is insulin, which is co-mitogenic with hepatocyte growth factor, and patients with diabetes actually have uh, less regenerative capacity. And then we also know that regeneration occurs less in cirrhotic livers than in uh, normal livers. And this was just a study that was performed at uh, Malincrot, you know, now nearly 20 years ago, where they were doing PVE for gene therapy. And you can see when they um, had, uh, when they did the portal vein embolization procedure, that you see hypertrophy and atrophy uh, here. And you also see incorporation of BRDU into the cells, which shows that there actually are uh, replicating uh, cells that are taking up the, uh, the BRDU. So um, there's basically, bless you. So basically, uh, there's been a lot of controversy in recent years over the usefulness of portal vein embolization. And uh, I just wanted to bring to your attention some of the issues. 
Uh, some of the concerns are, you know, whether PVE really does improve the safety of major hepatic resection and survival. Uh, there's also been uh, proposed alternate techniques to PVE such that it is that, that particular technique is no longer uh, deemed necessary. And then the question is, is research related to PVE and liver regeneration and IR still viable? Now, back in 2004, I was at, a, I was at the IHPBA meeting in Washington, D.C., and I was presenting some of the work on, on, on PVE. And one of our uh, leading uh, members of our uh, interventional radiology slash interventional oncology uh, society uh, came up to me and said, why am I still working on this stuff? Uh, everything we, we already know everything that needs to be known, so why don't you try something else? And uh, you know, as you'll see, there's a lot more excitement than, than, than just that. So um, in terms of uh, PVE improving FLR function, you can see that from nuclear medicine studies, there's been low bar functional shifts from the embolized to the non-embolized side. We also know from having patients that have bilateral bile duct um, uh, drainage catheters that the bile flow shifts from the embolized to the non-embolized side. And we also know that after PVE, when looking at those patients that did not have PVE, that the, uh, there's less alteration in liver function tests after PVE. In terms of the overall results and impact on major liver resection, there was a meta-analysis that was done in 2008, which showed that for 37 publications in 1,088 patients, that the morbidity rate of doing PVE was very, very low. 2.2% you know, is extremely low. And there were no deaths reported in any of the studies. And 85% of these patients actually underwent their planned hepatectomy in 85%. So that's really, I think, uh, really, really great numbers. Now, the patients that did not get resected, the majority of them had some kind of progression of their liver metastases, which in some cases is uh, due to patient selection. Now, back in the older days when imaging wasn't so, wasn't so good, there were probably a lot of patients that had micrometastases that, or, or imaging, uh, or metastases that were too small to be picked up by imaging that then blossomed after the PVE, and then those patients ultimately didn't get the surgery. So in some way, there's actually a usefulness of excluding patients from surgery that probably would not really benefit. How is PVE performed? Well, the initial description from Makuchi, the one that I you know, mentioned was the seminal paper, was done via the transiliocolic venous approach. Okay, and this was just where they cannulate the iliocolic vein in the OR, uh, catheterize it up into the portal system, and then inject whatever material uh, they wanted to inject. Um, the main or original percutaneous approach was called the contralateral approach, and that's access through the remnant liver. That is the part of the liver that's gonna remain after surgery. Okay. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the most uh, important disadvantage is that you could potentially injure the future liver remnant, as you'll see in this case here, where this patient had um, their left liver was considered the liver remnant, and you can see that there's a large pseudoaneurysm in the left liver with a large hematoma. This patient got embolized, but because of the um, lack of flow to the liver, uh, this patient was not considered a candidate for resection. So when uh, back in like the early 2000s, when I first started talking about these at meetings like SIR, I would have people raise their hands on which procedure, which, which way they would do it, contralateral, ipsilateral. And 90 something percent would always say contralateral because it seems very easy and you just quickly inject and that's it. But it, all it takes now is that one of these cases where you basically take a resectable patient and make them unresectable and you may change your, your mind. So this is the ipsilateral approach where you actually, uh, where you um, will uh, do the procedure through access of the diseased liver, okay? And uh, this, the main advantage here is that it really avoids FLR injury, okay? Now there are some disadvantages, which means sometimes that you need to complete the procedure through previously occluded portal veins that you've already treated, but that's usually not that uh, big a deal. And at the same time, when you have massive tumors that involve almost the entire right lobe, it may not really be possible. So just to show you some cases, I mean, this is a paper from a paper that we published a uh, uh, long time ago now, where this was a hematoma that was uh, done during the ipsilateral approach. And this was simply resected at the time, or simply evacuated at the time of resection. And this is a case that's pretty similar to the first case I showed of the liver injury. But in this case, it was done in the liver that was going to be removed. So the patient was fortunately able to have their surgery. So you can see that there's uh, rationale to doing ipsilateral approach, where in the past, 
uh, there were major advocates for only doing contralateral. In terms of indications for PVE, um, what I wanted to express here is that this is probably one of the most um, collaborative procedures that we do in IR, I would think. Um, this is something that really relies on a multidisciplinary approach. Patients don't usually uh, call you or your, um, your assistants to say they want to schedule a PVE with you, um, which is not the case for patients that have, for example, uh, you know, need a transarterial therapy or maybe varicose veins or fibroid embolization. They'll come right to you. But here, this is really a collaboration between surgery uh, sometimes hepatology, sometimes medical oncology, and your uh, interventional radiologist. So when looking to see which are the indications for this, we look at four real main factors. We look at whether patients have underlying liver disease. As I had mentioned, uh, these patients already have a reduced regenerative capacity. And if it's unclear if they have cirrhosis, you would do a core biopsy of the non-tumorous liver. We look at patient size with the understanding that larger patients require larger liver remnants, and I'll get into that in a second, why standardization of um, liver volumetry is critical. We also need to look at the extent of hepatic and associated non-hepatic surgery, and then other factors, as I had mentioned, whether patients have diabetes or whether they've been on extensive uh, preoperative chemotherapy. This just shows how we do it. Uh, we only care about the amount of liver remaining. We do not really care about the liver that's going to be resected. Um, this helps us measure the FLR before or after PVE and before or after resection. And we get a formula called the FLR over the total estimated liver volume uh, so we can actually allow for um, similar results. So this is just the formula. And it's based on a linear regression equation of over 500 Western adults. And we really use uh, body surface area here. So what ends up happening is that you have the numerator, which is the FLR, and the denominator actually is this equation. And it doesn't change from the pre to the post scan. Okay, so in that way, when one lobe is hypertrophying and the other lobe is actually atrophying, you actually take into account only what's in the FLR. Okay, and we know this is important because we've seen or you know heard of patients that were treated in, in other institutions where they use the standard in measuring the total liver volume before and after. And what would happen is that the numerator could possibly stay the same, but the denominator could actually shrink, and then you have what looks like it, it looks like it's some hypertrophy when in fact you didn't have any, and then after surgery the patients actually died. So um, it's very important to be able to compare only the FLR pre to the FLR post. And this just shows an example of a patient with colorectal metastases. Uh, the FLR increased from 17 to 30%, and that number is a, it's called the degree of hypertrophy, in this case, 13%. Uh, we also can use this standardized FLR to predict the complication rate, and we can see in normal underlying liver that if you have less than 20%, there's a fourfold increase in the overall number of complications in those that had um, more than 20% of their FLR remaining. And we also know in the setting of underlying liver disease that patients that have more than 285 ml per meter squared uh, do not die of liver failure in the setting of uh, injured liver. We also uh, wanted to test um, what the effect of PVE was on outcome, and there was some controversy on this and when you actually need to do the procedure. Do you need it in 20%, 25%? In France, for example, they would use 30% as the cutoff for normal underlying liver. A lot of this is based on formula, the, the formulas I kind of mentioned earlier. And what we found is that uh, in 301 consecutive uh, extended right hepatectomies, that as long as patients have more than 20%, and these are patients here that had less than 20% for PVE and then ultimately had more than 20%, these were patients that already had 20% and then had PVE and then had obviously more than 20%. And then these were patients that already had 20% and then therefore did not need PVE. And there was no significant statistical significance. So ultimately the whole idea here is that PVE is an essential component for resection when the FLR is insufficient, but as long as you have 20% in the setting of normal underlying liver, PVE is not necessary. Now, those are just absolute numbers. Um, what we really need to also look at is dynamic measures of liver regeneration. So we need to see how much the liver is actually growing. And you can see here when we do what's called the degree of hypertrophy, which is taking the amount of FLR post and subtracting the pre, what the number is. And I had mentioned in the previous uh, one that it was 17%. Well, we know that if the degree of hypertrophy is less than 5%, then you get a much higher rate of complications than those that are greater 
than 5%. And this just shows two livers, okay, a tail of two livers. In the first liver, it's a patient that has cirrhosis, 20% FLR. The second patient has um, steatosis, you know, 5% steatosis, which is almost a normal uh, liver. They both were getting surgery, and they both had 20% FLR. They both had different surgery procedures, mind you. So uh, the uh, FLR grew 19% in the cirrhotic, but only grew 1% in the patient with normal underlying liver. And ultimately, you can see that this patient, cirrhotic, had an uneventful hospital course where the patient that had a normal underlying liver but a very poor regeneration actually died from liver failure. So what we can now use is the 20% is the FLR and also use the 5 five percent degree of hypertrophy and actually achieve a 90 day zero uh, mortality which is pretty amazing that said is that even enough okay so we now know what the FLR volume should be in these different scenarios and we also know what the degree of hypertrophy should be but is that really sufficient so what's really important and we'll get into this with some other um, types of procedures is growth kinetics okay of the liver and what we really need to know is how fast the liver is growing after the PVE. So it's not a matter of at, at time zero, it's this, and at time one month, it's this. We really need to know how it's actually trending. And what we can do is what's called the kinetic growth rate, which is the degree of hypertrophy per week. And here you can see that um, there's a slope of a curve. It's basically patient specific. And by using this information, we can see which patients really should have surgery after PVE. So here we see three patients. All three of them have what looks like a, a sufficient degree of hypertrophy. This one's 24, 15, and eight. However, the one that had eight uh, actually died of liver failure. Okay, so when we went back, and we looked at why this patient died because we thought the patient should have sufficient hypertrophy. It actually took twice as long to get that 8% than the person that had 24% or 15%. So when we look at what the kinetic growth rate is, you can see that, uh, that the patient that had the very slow rate of growth uh, actually uh, was the one that died of uh, liver failure. So it's not just simply that you have an FLR size, absolute volume, and the degree of hypertrophy, but you also need to look at the kinetic growth rate. So when we now look at the kinetic growth rate, we can see that there's 0% hepatic insufficiency and 0% 90-day mortality by using these parameters. So I think that this is actually very, very important information. Uh, as far as, and, and this is actually not simply whether you should have PVE, but it's, it's, it's all about whether patients that have PVE should actually have their resection, which is probably even more important. As far as absolute contraindications to PVE, you have anyone that would be considered not a candidate for surgery, uh, such as uh, those that have overt clinical portal hypertension, uh, those that have extensive portal vein invasion, um, which uh, means that they're, 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 it's very difficult to get the uh, embolic material in, and also those that have complete portal vein occlusion or lobar occlusion. So these patients will already have, should have compensatory hypertrophy and may not even need um, the embolization procedure. Uh, relative contraindications, some of these used to be absolute <coughs> back when we first started doing these. Uh, extra hepatic disease was always considered absolute, but now in patients that have small amounts of uh, liver nodules, they may even operate. And then those that have tumor extension to the future liver remnant, we'll discuss a little later about two-stage hepatectomies <coughs> and how those patients could actually be treated now. But these back in the years 2000s uh, were actually considered absolute contraindications to PBE. Pre-procedure workup is like any other patient. Um, it's important to understand that uh, we need to look really at cross-sectional imaging. We look at portal vein variants. They're a lot more common than we used to believe. Uh, there were ultrasound studies that showed only 10% uh, variant anatomy, but now with CT, we know that there's about 40% of patients have portal vein variants. So that's important both for the PVE and for the surgery. And uh, we, again, need to look at the volumetry. We used to treat patients as inpatients with this procedure. Uh, nowadays, with the uh, need for hospital beds, we um, found that even embolizing 85 to 90 percent of a patient's portal venous system, you could send the, these patients never got complications and never really needed to be admitted. Um, so we used to, so so so, so we now um, we used to admit the patients, but now we'll send them out after four hours, like as if it was a liver biopsy. So the reason why we can do that is that unlike transarterial therapies these patients only have apoptosis and not necrosis, which is what causes patients to be really sick. 
So these patients actually do very well and don't need um, to be admitted. And then uh, we repeat the cross-sectional imaging in four weeks and then look to see if the patient should have their surgery. In terms of outcomes after PVE, there's been only one prospective clinical trial ever looking at the benefit of uh, right hepatectomy, right PVE in the setting of right hepatectomy. Uh, the reason why this is, there's only going to be one study is that those people or those surgeons that believe in PVE are not going to expose their patients to not having PVE. So if a patient dies because they were uh, randomized into the non-PVE group, there'll be a lot of uh, you know, ethical concerns and repercussions. So as you can see here, there's one study, and uh, this shows that in those patients that had PVE, they had a much better post-operative course than those that did not have PVE. And this is just a case where we had a 56-year-old man with cirrhosis, hep B and C positive, and a 10-centimeter solitary right HCC. Uh, we measured the FLR to be 33%, and we said in cirrhosis, you need 40%. Patient was considered a candidate for right PVE. Uh, 40 weeks, uh, four weeks later, we saw an 18% uh, growth. And then this is what the liver looks like intraoperatively. You can see that there's um, a very atrophic, dusky appearance to the liver that was embolized, and that the side of the liver that was, was not embolized, or the future liver remnant, is very, very, um, is very, very um, hypertrophic. So this patient did very well, and unfortunately had a recurrence of five years, which would then underwent successful transplant. This was a study from uh, my days at MD Anderson, where we looked at patients that in a similar population, but this was retrospective, and we found that in those patients that did not have PVE, there was an 18% mortality. That is uh, six patients out of 33, and nearly all were due to, just to um, uh, liver insufficiency. And then if we look at overall survival, we can see that there's, using PVE, that there's a near five, a near five-year uh, overall survival in those patients that had PVE versus those that didn't. What we have to understand about this slide is that in those patients that did not have PVE, those patients would not have had surgery, and then they would have probably undergone a transarterial therapy, leading them to have basically a 20 to 30 uh, percent three-year survival. So we were able to get these patients to about a 50% five-year survival, and instead they would have had a 20 to 30% three-year survival. So I think that it shows very important information. Um, one area that's become a very hot topic has been what's called sequential arterial and portal vein embolization. Um, and the rationale is listed here, which is that we already discussed that the regenerative capacity of the liver uh, may be impaired in those patients that have cirrhosis. Uh, we also know that most HCCs and other liver tumors are hypervascular, so we're able to actually treat the tumor at the same time while we're in the waiting period. And then there's also uh, arterial portal shunts that can be found in cirrhotic livers and HCC tumors, which may attenuate the PVE. So this was just the original study that was found in uh, from the University of Tokyo, which showed 94% uh, uh, rate of hepatectomy, as well as excellent five-year overall <laughs> disease-free survivals. And this is a case of a patient with a 12.5 centimeter solitary right HCC. Baseline AFP was over 61,000. And this patient did have some uh, fibrosis with uh, focal bridging. We did the measurements, 27%. The patient was considered a candidate. We performed conventional taste with this patient. And what I want you to also focus on here is that we, and I'll get into this a little later, is that, 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 that we did arterial embolization here, but you can see that there's filling of the portal vein uh, venules, and that will come into play later. But the point for this particular purpose is that the patient underwent PVE. Here we can see that the patient's uh, right posterior sector PVE based on the arterial embolization was actually occluded, so we only had to do the anterior sector PVE. And then this patient ended up with massive hypertrophy, degree of hypertrophy of uh, 20%. And ultimately, this patient had massive necrosis of their liver tumor and their whole right lobe, and ultimately went from a preoperative um, AFP from 61,000 to a pre, well, pre-PVE uh, uh, from 61,000 to a pre-operative uh, AFP of, of only three or 2.9. So you can see that we were able to very uh, effectively reduce the uh, tumor burden. And then this patient underwent a successful uh, right hepatectomy and was, a lot, it was uh, alive 92 months later. And then I moved institutions and then I lost uh, basically the follow-up. Um, we found also that PVE, um, Needs, is, is we also found in this in this study that you get much better hypertrophy using the combined approach, and you get 83% complete response, and that you really need about three weeks 
to wait between the two so you don't get liver infarction, which then makes the patients uh, very, very sick. And this was just a much larger study from Korea, which showed that you get, again, much better uh, regenerative capacity with the combined approach, as well as better overall and disease-free survival with the uh, combined approach, such that um, a consensus panel met in 2010, and it was reported in 2011, which basically stated that chemoembolization followed by PVE should be considered in all patients that have chronic liver disease and who are candidates for major hepatic resection. Um, one uh, thing I wanted to note based on the last case was that can we use this strategy to then be definitive therapy for HCC? And this is a case that I showed earlier in the talk, which shows this patient with a 17 centimeter HCC with multiple satellite nodules has poor, uh, relatively, I mean, not, not very bad, but relatively bad for surgery, uh, hepatic function, and ultimately um, underwent the combined uh, chemoembolization followed by an actual staged uh, PVE. So you can see here we did one, uh, so the, we did the um, anterior sector PVE first uh, after one month, and then another month later did the posterior sector PVE. And then this patient actually, again, never was going to be a surgical candidate, uh, lived at least 70 months um, after the combined uh, resection. I mean, combined uh, treatment. And um, again, I lost him to follow up because I left the institution. In terms of uh, normal underlying liver and colon mets, you can see here that there's a nearly five, um, a nearly um, similar uh, five year overall survival for those patients that had PVE versus those that didn't. Again, this is in the setting of normal underlying liver. And this is the case I showed earlier in the talk where we have, tum we have, we have um, tumors in six out of the eight um, quinoid segments. So this patient first underwent chemotherapy where you can see that there was massive shrinkage of all the tumors. It was then believed this patient could be a surgical candidate. So the surgeon uh, did a um, left lateral liver resection or a partial hepatectomy there, and then measured the FLR in the left lateral liver to be 16%. We did PVE, uh, increased it to 26%, and then um, uh, was able to get their second stage hepatectomy and then uh, did very well. This just shows that um, we can extend the boundaries of surgery by uh, having similar survival and, and outcomes in patients that had a one-stage hepatectomy, that is patients that did not have tumor within their liver remnant, uh, to those that had tumor in their liver remnant, that is the uh, two-stage hepatectomy. And then this was a study that we published in Journal of Clinical Oncology, which uh, showed that in carefully selected patients, you can get a 60% uh, five years survival if you are able to get through to the second stage. That is, the patients uh, didn't progress. Now, one of the major concerns regarding PVE is that there's a, uh, a number of patients, that is about 35%, that actually don't get resected. And that could be either due to insufficient FLR hypertrophy or tumor progression within the four to six week interval between when you do the PVE versus when you would do the resection. So alternate um, approaches have been applied. Um, one approach, and this is just a, a couple of case reports from the early two, 2000s, was that you can do arterial embolization after PVE. Now, what's important to understand is that uh, the tumor throne, we, we now do a lot of chemoembolization or conventional taste or Y90 or whatever in patients that have tumor vein thrombus, but it's not the same kind of tumor thrombus or complete occlusion that you get with PVE. So patients actually do get, can get very sick after this combined approach. So in these, in these cases, these were really selective uh, procedures. And in these cases, all of the patients underwent subsequent um, hypertrophy and then, uh, and then um, uneventful resection. One topic that's been very, very uh, hot of late, and I actually did a debate at WCIO recently, was on the topic of radiation lobectomy. So as you all know, uh, Y90 radioembolization is a procedure we perform uh, very often for patients with uh, liver cancer. <clears throat> the goal here is to treat the tumor, right? But then what was found uh, was that uh, in those patients, and this is particularly done in the setting of HCC, is that you end up getting a contralateral hypertrophy, okay? So um, in terms of some of these studies, the idea here is that you can do what's called a test of time. You can wait to see how the patient's gonna do before you actually operate, and if the patient's liver grows, um, that's fine, and at the same time, you're also treating the tumors, and in some of these patients, out of 83, um, a small number of them actually had hepatectomy and or a transplant. And you can see here from this uh, patient 
that nine months after the Y90, this patient with HCC actually developed massive hypertrophy compared to previous. So we only embolized with Y90 the right lobe, okay, and didn't embolize the uh, left lobe, and you can see massive hypertrophy, but again, it took about nine months. So the problem is that the people that advocate this are not really um, stating why this occurs, okay? Um, it turns out that the radiation, as we all uh, would expect, uh, actually results in fibrosis of the liver, okay? And it's really difficult if you're trying to build a Y90 program at an institution, like to develop a new program, and have, sometimes you get feedback or a pushback from the medical oncologists who say that Y90 causes cirrhosis, okay? And uh, here, we're actually stating, um, not obviously, but in a way you're kind of implying that patients will get cirrhosis if you treat these patients like this. But at the end of the day, the fact is, is that it does cause hypertrophy. And I just wanted to bring up the idea that the reason is that it does cause fibrosis of the part of the liver that's being um, treated. And this was a case that we treated with bilobar tumors. Um, and this is just, again, some patients with colorectal metastases have been treated uh, with, I guess, what you call radi radiation lobectomy. And as you can see, these patients actually have massively cirrhotic looking uh, livers. That's not to say that patients undergoing chemotherapy, uh, you know, from medical oncologists don't get the same picture. But, you know, at some point you want to be able to collaborate with the oncologist and offer them uh, various treatments. So the problem with radiation lobectomy is that uh, we talked about kinetic growth rate. And the kinetic growth rate in terms of uh, Y90 is much, 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 much slower than those that have PVE, okay? So that these patients do not have that 2% hypertrophy that we would be expecting and that what we said earlier is that what is necessary not to have death after or liver insufficiency after resection. So the idea here is that, in my opinion, that we should really, if patients are resectable now, they should really get their PVE and not radiation lobectomy unless there's a reason. And ultimately, we need to really look more into whether patients should have, um, you know, what, what, you know, what, 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 what um, I guess, mechanisms or what um, um, biomarkers should be used in the setting of radiation lobectomy. So, you know, some, some of these, some people that advocate this are actually thinking this is a new idea. Okay, so I just wanna show you uh, some uh, interesting information. So this was a 72 year old man that we were gonna treat with plant sequential bland embo followed by PVE for an HCC. And we only did bland embolization because I knew we were gonna do PVE and then he was gonna get resected. So I really wasn't concerned about the actual how we did the embolization. But ultimately this patient only underwent bland embolization and had massive hypertrophy of the right lobe and ultimately had the surgery without the PVE. Okay, so this is an anecdote but if we look, that uh, this is a study published in radiology by Tom Vogel from Germany, where they just basically coiled the right uh, hepatic artery, and they found hypertrophy, and that was 20 years ago, okay? And even more recently, uh, there was a study of hyalur carcinoma. This is a prospective randomized trial from Germany, where they looked at 50 patients. They were undergoing a... a planned extended right hepatectomy, and they also performed um, bland embolization with particles and coils, and then they compared that to um, patients that had PVE, and they found that yes, both um, uh, resulted in hypertrophy, but that PVE uh, was much better in terms of hypertrophy. So um, this, the concept of radiation lobectomy causing hypertrophy, uh, for some, is a new concept, but the idea of arterial embolization has been around for a long period of time. There's also other uh, approaches. This one is called sequential PVE, followed by sequential hepatic vein embolization. This was uh, first performed in Korea, and this was done after patients had undergone PVE, and then they didn't regenerate sufficiently, and then they believed that if you can embolize the, the, either the right and or hepat middle hepatic veins, that you would get kind of a Bud Chiari syndrome kind of picture, and you would ultimately get better hypertrophy, and that has been shown to be true. Um, and there's a recent French group that um, started doing what's called liver, liver venous deprivation, where you do the portal vein embolization and hepatic vein embolization in the single setting. And this was done, again, um, for the same purpose, and these are largely due in patients that have uh, colorectal cancer, and what they found is that you can uh, do this in a very safe way, and it really doesn't affect the patients, and these patients do undergo uh, resection.
And then there's been interest in portal administration of stem cells. So there's a German group that did PVE and added stem cells to the uh, future liver remnants. And what they found is that they increased their hypertrophy in a statistically significant fashion, uh, nearly double. They found that they had less major complications, an increased FLR, and, a, and an overall increased survival. And then as far as one of the procedures that's taken off in terms of the surgical literature, and this is something that's been competing with, um, with, with, with PVE a lot uh, in recent, in recent uh, years, is called ALPS. Yeah, this is a way that, that, that surgeons can actually do all this themselves and not uh, get um, interventional radiologists included in a lot of this. Um, I'm not saying that's the reason, but there's, there is a reason why they believe this is better. So what they do is that they do intraoperative portal vein ligation, and then they devascularize segment four in patients that needed um, an extended right hepatectomy. Okay? This is usually done in those patients that would require a two-stage hepatectomy, okay? similar to what we kind of briefly mentioned. And then they have to come back. So, so they basically devascularize segment four of the liver, and they, uh, they ligate the right portal vein, and then they... Um, have to go back very soon after to get rid of the segment four necrosis. And what they find is that they get very rapid FLR growth and they believe there's a lower risk for tumor progression. And this was just some early data that was compared to PVE data from MD Anderson, which showed that yes, you do get much higher and faster rates of regeneration, but you do have a much higher complication rate and a much higher rate of mortality. And this was just a case that I wanted to show, which is interesting in the sense that it's a 49-year-old female with colorectal liver metastases who had chemotherapy. Uh, they performed ALPS on this patient. And what's interesting here is that this patient actually did not have tumor in their FLR. So why they performed an ALPS procedure, I'm not really clear. But ultimately, this was after stage one ALPS. And then after stage two, the patient basically had this massive uh, postoperative bio leak and ultimately went into ARDS, bleeding, and death. So um, this is something that's not uncommon in the ALPS world. Now, there's been uh, literature and there's been uh, some consensus conferences, one was in Hamburg to try to understand why patients that have ALPS um, don't um, have this complication rate and it was a registry that was uh, undertaken. And they found a lot of information out and I'll get into that in a second, but basically the idea here is that the kinetic growth rate for ALPS is much, much faster than even that of PVE, okay? However, if we look at the, but some of these patients still go into liver failure and some of them still die, and the fact that they get this hypertrophy, um, we would think is sufficient. However, there's been some histopathologic studies now from Japan, which actually show that in those patients that have ALPS versus those that have PVE, the cells are actually much more immature than those that had PVE. So you can just see from some of, from some of these um, um, electron microscopy that the um, actual organelles within the cells that uh, were regenerating in the Alps were immature. And also there was a lot more, um, a lot, th th there was a lot less um, lipofuscin, which is an indicator of cellular maturity. So uh, those patients in Alps actually um, did worse in terms of uh, having uh, appropriate cells. And then this was just a meta-analysis that was just done this year, which showed that once they actually uh, figured out which patients were, um, should, should have ALPS or could have ALPS, that there's now a near similar uh, morbidity and mortality from surgery. So I think that this is something that we need to keep an eye on in terms of IR, uh, whether or not PVE and ALPS are going to be uh, the more um, reasonable alternative. The fact is, is that there's a lot of patients, including those that have um, HCC, cholangiocarcinoma, those that are over 60 years old even, that can't really, they shouldn't have ALPS. So there's, a, so, so there's a lot of patients and issues that have to do with that. Now, what are the unmet needs for regenerating liver and IR? And this is where we're gonna get into some really interesting stuff, including some translational research, which is um, what do patients uh, do that have PVE but then ultimately don't get resected? And then are there approaches that also don't involve puncturing the liver? Because I mentioned that puncturing the liver could lead to patients not having uh, their surgery. So this was one approach called reversible PVE where they used um, what's called CureSpawn powder and they were able to within two weeks 
um, recatalyze the portal vein because we know that most of the liver regeneration occurs within the first two weeks. So if it turns out that the patient does not get the surgery, now you have an open portal vein again. Okay. What we used to call this in the early days of PVE was a failed PVE. But uh, this is uh, what they started doing, and this is a study that was done in monkeys. And then in terms of avoiding transhepatic puncture, there's now some uh, uh, interest in doing transplenic puncture. And this was stimulated by a lot of um, work on now what's called PVR tips, which is portal vein recanalization in tips patients that have portal vein thrombosis and uh, you know, ultimately get these patients to transplant. So this is another approach. And then there's been uh, interest in transjugular approaches to doing PVE. Now, I'm not sure why you would necessarily do this. I think this is actually more dangerous than a percutaneous puncture, but uh, this is also now in the literature. And then there's what's called transsinusoidal PVE, which is similar to the transjugular approach where you go into the hepatic vein and you can use a balloon catheter and, and force, um, um, in, in this case, onyx, through the hepatic sinusoids from the hepatic vein into the portal vein. So that's another way that you can actually do this. And unfortunately, at this time, there's really no hypertrophy data, but it's from a, more of a feasibility approach. And then one of the things that I wanted to focus on and for the rest of this talk is transarterial approaches to PVE and cirrhosis. So what we did, and this was a study that was uh, funded by the SIR Foundation, was what's called transarterial PVE. And I already showed you a case where we did a very aggressive transarterial chemoembolization, and the patient's portal vein uh, became occluded. So this was a method that I came up with years ago that um, you basically use the hepatic sinusoidal anatomy by going through the artery, and as we know from conventional taste, you can go through the artery and the lipidol eventually ends up in the portal vein. So you never have to actually do a direct puncture. So I wanted to compare um, in an animal model um, the transarterial versus the transhepatic approach. So we did this in eight pigs that had transhepatic and eight pigs that had transarterial. We came up with a lipidol ratio of three to one, um, lipidol to ethanol. And we had five experimental and three controls in each group. And this just shows um, immediately after the embolization what the FLR looks like, and then four weeks later what the uh, FLR looks like. And you'll see that after the transarterial approach, this massive hypertrophy of the liver remnant compared to the transhepatic approach. Okay, so although it was not found to be statistically significant, um, that was basically probably due to the uh, lack of uh, sufficient animals, um, we can see that there's double the hypertrophy in terms of those patients that had um, the transarterial approach versus those that had the transhepatic approach. And this just shows the uh, gross and histopathology. And you can see that there's a very, very shrunken appearing uh, liver of those that had um, um, undergone the arterial embolization procedure. So that gave me um, an idea of an animal model for cirrhosis. Because at that time, when we were first doing this, the main animal model for cirrhosis was one that was performed in Oregon at the Dodder Institute, where they just infused old, which is the you know, non-spherical PVA, and infused it all over the liver. And what they did get in, the, in, in their studies was that they didn't see necessarily a cirrhotic looking liver, but they found an immediate increase in uh, patients' uh, portal hypertension, okay? However, at, th at, at, at one month, the portal, the, the, it all recannulated, recanalized, and they were not able to sustain the portal hypertension. So that was the only animal model I can find that was in a large animal that was not giving a pig um, or, or a woodchuck, um, you know, a year full of uh, carbon tetrachloride. So we just did the procedure the same way we did the transarterial approach, but instead we infused 28 um, mLs of uh, three to one ratio, a thiodol to pyodol, into the uh, hepatic artery. And what we found was that we were able to get a sustained um, uh, portal hypertension. We found also that we did see some ascites after the uh, after the embolization procedure, and we also found that a lot of patients, a lot of the pigs, actually had cirrhosis. So this is what's called the Metavir score, where zero is no fibrosis to four is overt cirrhosis, and most of the pigs that we treated actually had a uh, Meta Metavir score of four. And this just shows the gross pathology in the explanted liver. And this just shows the histopathology showing all of the fibrous tissue.
And this then led us to a study of MR elastography, where we were able to then show that um, you know, before a baseline uh, patients that had a Medivere score of zero and no fibrosis and what the liver stiffness looked like and looked at those after they had a Medivere score of four and what the liver uh, looked like. And ultimately we were able to show that using MR elastography and using this uh, animal model of cirrhosis, they were able to get a reliable non-invasive technique to measure liver stiffness. And we were also able to correlate positively liver stiffness with hepatic vein uh, portal uh, uh, gradients, as well as liver stiffness and the amount of fibrosis. And then lastly, um, I just wanted to go over a study that we just got published in, um, in radiology, which was one that uh, was funded by the uh, RSNA uh, Foundation and was one that um, one of my uh, residents and uh, soon became a fellow and then became an attending had uh, gotten a, a trainee grant from the RSNA which was looking at endothelial cell therapy. Okay, that's not the same thing as, cell, as stem cell therapy necessarily, but it's a way where you can infuse cells that are in very precursor states, and these cells actually will um, admit um, or, or, or uh, show what's called angiocrine factors, which then have a very local effect on uh, the, stem, the, the uh, uh, pluripotent stem cells and then turn them into liver cells within the liver. So I think that this is very exciting. So we did this in uh, eight pigs. You know, four were the experimental and four were the um, uh, control. And we were able to use fluorescence to follow where these uh, were going. And we looked uh, three weeks later to see what exactly happened to these. Um, we were able to isolate these cells. And there's a very, very uh, uh, well-known group at Cornell that does this. and. Um, Basically, they were able to take cores that we gave them and um, expand these cells, okay? And then we were able to deliver them directly into the portal vein after we uh, developed the cirrhosis model and, you know, and then get them in. What's interesting about this is that unlike um, cells that uh, for um, pancreatic islet cell transplantation where you actually need engraftment, these cells don't seem to actually need engraftment because we only see that there's, um, that there's still the microscopy fluorescence at one hour, and you know, three weeks later, we actually don't see any. But the fact is that when you look at the histopathology, this was the normal liver, this was the fibrotic liver that we uh, got with the, um, with the animal model of cirrhosis, and then after the cellular therapy, you can see that we were able to basically uh, nearly reverse the fibrosis uh, within the liver. So interestingly, you know, once this was published, we ended up getting some uh, phone calls or uh, consults from places as far away as India who thought we can use this on someone's you know, parents that had uh, liver cirrhosis. But obviously this is in an animal and it's so far away from, from, from reality that uh, we obviously weren't able to do that. But I think that this is at least a very first step in trying to understand uh, stem cell and endothelial cell therapies for cirrhosis. And I think there's a lot of applications for this. So in conclusion, um, I hope I was able to show you that there's lots of different ways that we can use liver regeneration to manage patients with primary and metastatic liver cancer, that there's numerous strategies, both uh, percutaneous and surgical as a means to do this, and that we're currently just in our infancy, as I mentioned you know, uh, back earlier in the talk, that back in 2004, I was really told that we had already known everything that needs to be done and there's not really any real interest in this, but I think that we're just in the infancy and I think there's a lot of work that uh, really can be done. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your you know, invitation and attention and uh, answer any questions.